Today we look into the healthcare sector, focusing on clicks, Discam, Netcare, and Life Healthcare. Keith McLaughlin from Integral Asset Management joins us with that analysis. Keith, a pleasure. Good afternoon. Good to be here. Well, Keith, um, I'm actually keen to find out how you want to, uh, you know, do this uh, by virtue of the fact that Netcare and health, Life Healthcare seem more similarly aligned as this came in clicks as well, but they all have uh, their convergences. So I'm keen to get your thoughts on how you'd like to uh, take a, a go at this one. Sure. Well, if, first of all, there's a couple of themes that really con converge in this uh, sector. Um, globally and domestically, uh, economies on risky spaces. So the underlying healthcare themes are very defensive. Specific to South Africa and very topical, national healthcare NHR was signed into uh, signed in by the president just pre-election. Um, how that plays out and it's had a big effect uh, in, in in the healthcare market. You can see that the indices haven't fully recovered in uh, in most of these uh, stocks since uh, pre-signing of the NHR in, um, and. Uh, one would argue that, first of all, to some degree, is priced in the second. The second degree is really we have a government of national unity now. So what might have been an election ploy might be a, a bill that's dead in the water. Uh, it certainly doesn't have the financing uh, to back it, maybe, uh, and will certainly be challenged legislatively, challenged uh, legally. Uh, by, by, by all the all the stakeholders in the sector. So the market that's priced it in may actually offer opportunities now if we look forward. And then uh, don't forget, uh, we've got an SA Inc. story because Government of National Unity shows a functioning democracy. It's arguably one of, one of the great outcomes from our national election. Uh, so there's, there's a strong SA centric uh, theme here because all of these are South African businesses. They aren't they, they don't really have large exposures offshore, only really life healthcare uh, has, has a little bit, the rest uh, don't. They're very solid, the SA Inc. equity. So this is how, how the theme converges. Brilliant. Uh, let's get into maybe live healthcare now that you've mentioned it there uh, and their latest set of numbers, Keith. But also, I know that they made a big disposal. And I'm wondering how, what that tells also about uh, just the overall strategy of this business. Sure. So a life healthcare really was built as a hospital group, and they they built out ancillary parts of the businesses in, uh, in, in in into the healthcare space. Most recently, and included in the disposal is the imaging side. There is Alliance Medical that you're talking about. That was that seems to have been somewhat an opportunic, uh, opportunistic uh, disposal, and they have. Uh, realizing about uh, 10 billion in, in capital, they have distributed back to shareholders about eight uh, eight billion. Um, but but really, it's a hospital play with without looking much beyond that. Um, and as a South African hospital play, really you have to look at it in comparison to Netcare. And unfortunately, until recently, we had MediClinic listed on the JSE. Now we have to rely on Remgrow for that disclosure. But this is this is right up there in one of one of the three big players in the private private hospital market in South Africa. Keith, often when you hear, uh, you know, uh, people speaking about uh, hospitals, uh, Netcare, Life, Healthcare, like they speak about it uh, like it's a hotel. Uh, you know, that, that term always comes up that it's like a hotel. The way in which we think about how revenue would be made in a hotel, very similar in uh, this uh, part. Just talk to us about that and what we are seeing from uh, a South African perspective, also considering that South Africans are strained, high, high unemployment, and also the population on medical aid, uh, which can possibly afford these uh, uh, um, uh, uh, clinics and these hospitals not so big. Certainly. So, and it's 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 an apt comparison to a hotel company. But I'll, I would go a little bit further. They really subsets of property companies, uh, and both in the hotel and in the hospital, you build a large building, you and you try to populate in a hotel rooms in a hospital beds uh, with uh, with effectively paying paying people. Uh, for, for whichever service they're coming from. Now, hotel tends to be cyclical and hospital is defensive. Uh, when you're sick, you need what you need. Then we shift around to, to the points you made, and those, those are astute observations. The insured lives in South Africa have not really grown. For, for the last decade or so, it's a, it's a subset function of employment, and employment has not grown. If you're not employed, the odds are you are not on the medical aid, and therefore uh, probably not participating in the private medical sector. But 
what is subtle is within the medical aid coverage in South Africa, we actually have an aging population that demand this utilization. So the utilization demands are going up. Therefore, uh, if you're going back to your hotel uh, metaphor, and perhaps perhaps it won't work, we'll see how it works. Uh, imagine as a the insured lives ages in South Africa, they demand more holidays, they, they utilize more beds. Um, so, so there are those, uh, those tailwinds in their favor in this space. But the nature, the nature of the beast is this is a constrained environment that has been put at risk in terms of structurally by the NHR bill. Um, and they, they aren't, I mean, the, the, most of these players are running at about 60, 62 percent, 63, 64 percent occupancy. Uh, you really want to see them running uh, approaching the 70, 75 percent occupancy, so somewhat underutilized. COVID was not a tailwind for them. It was a headwind. Uh, it filled a lot of beds at very low margins, not to be careless about the pandemic, but it, it was not a boon to their businesses. It was the opposite. So these um, these tell, these headwinds have receded and they've started filling beds and there is a recovery story here. But um, absolutely, I mean, the environment is quite constrained. What we also know in South Africa, Keith, is very, very curious here, is that, uh, you know, medical inflation runs ahead of CPI. And I just wonder about this cost environment also uh, that informs, uh, you know, uh, these private health care groups here in South Africa. Because if we're honest, uh, it is expensive to access. And then uh, also what we are finding is, uh, of course, the issue of um, that eating into margins and the, the realistic margins that can then be charged by a live health care and it can. Definitely. So a way to understand the South African medical sector is to consider that the major medical aids are in fact the gatekeepers. Uh, so Discovery, Fed, Fed Health, uh, Bonitas, these medical aids and more subtly the administrators, so that's MedScheme and Discovery, the listed company that's an administrator of the medical uh, medical aid called Discovery, they are the they engage with these hospital groups and indeed other providers to try to collectively buy and push down prices. So it's a bit of bit of a tussle back and forth. And I'll give you an example Ooh. of how it kind of plays out. Um, Netcare lost, for example, in the last uh, last year or two, it's lost uh, some partnerships with medical aids that have gone to uh, life healthcare. So if one look at paid uh, paid patient days, you look at volumes through the door and then beds effectively, um, life healthcare looks better. But it won that by compressing its own margin. So it's been chasing volumes, and the superior top line growth has not fallen to superior bottom line growth, depending on how you measure it. Where Netcare has 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 uh, has lost out on, on volumes, but it's been managing its margins. Arguably, the mix and the quality of its business is better, uh, and therefore a a flat paid patients days. Uh, and a slightly lower revenue, in fact, has translated into margin expansion. So there, there is certainly a, a, a push and pull in this market, uh, coupled with the affordability of, of the ultimate uh, uh, consumer uh, in this case. And I don't think that's going away. I think that remains. It's a function of it. Uh, what what has been clever to see has been uh, clever to see how Netcare has been digitizing the operations. I think they are ahead of Life Healthcare and MediClinic in terms of this, and including this consumer app to tr you can follow and you can pre-book and the like in terms of that. So you could follow your own digital journey, follow your own data across the the organisation. All of this wrapped in with what is effectively a, a private offering. Um, where you can, you don't necessarily have to go through a medical aid. You can, in fact, go directly into a net care and get, get insured that way. Um, so they're trying to build out a more holistic offering, uh, which gives them levers to pull that some of the other guys just do not have. Um, but yeah, the, these are all astute observations. As much as one needs medical, medical, uh, well, health care in the broader sense of the word, you are competing against what is effectively a free public sector. And 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 that competition is where the trade-off is better quality in the private sector. It certainly comes with a higher price tag. 
And okay, before we move on from this, I want to speak a bit about growth, what growth might look like here. We've spoken about a net care moving into what I think is a very uh, innovative space. It really is taking what you have and trying to uh, reconfigure it. Uh, and that maybe speaks to organic growth. From an inorganic growth perspective for these two groups, uh, might there still be room for uh, some acquisitions? Uh, what does uh, you know the potential in the future look like, especially for a retail investor who's wondering if this might be the place to be? Sure. So to think of uh, organic growth in this space, the algorithm is really a population growth coupled with employment growth coupled with aging. So average age and population, which tends to increase the disease burden, tends to increase the healthcare demand. Uh, and so, like I said, you have to kind of separate South Africa into the insured lives versus the uninsured lives. The uninsured lives, employment is low. A population growth is high and average age is young. Insured lives, employment is, well, 100% more or less because the, the, if you have a job, you have medical aid. Um, although volume is not growing, number of lives not growing, the average age is. So, so the demand. So there is, couple that with some inflationary pricing and the fact that it, as a hospital group, you tend to have pretty fixed costs. So you, you should be able to squeeze out two, uh, let's call it one to 2% volume growth a year, um, coupled with some pricing above inflation, five to six, uh, five to 6% medical inflation. Somewhere we're looking at mid uh, mid to high single digit revenue growth medium term, but that ahead of inflationary growth and with operating leverage should, should translate into the low double digit bottom line growth. That's a way to think about the, the algorithm. Acquis acquisitively is an interesting question because if you go back to this industry about 10, 15 years ago, the move, the view was that this industry was saturated and one needed to go offshore. And all of that has largely been a, been a disaster. Many clinics, offshore operations have not worked. Um, um, Netcare exited the UK, if memory serves me correctly, it's maybe about six or seven years ago. Um, Life Healthcare, in fact, the Alliance Medical they sold was, was offshore. So it's been from the, the great exodus, it's been the great re retreat back into, uh, back into the core market, into the one thing you're good at doing, the thing that generates the cash flow, and re-looking at it. And you could see that, uh, th that that playing field is a lot smaller in terms of acquisitive growth. Do you move out and try to buy a, and there are second and third and fourth tier medical groups that are, that are operating out there. No one can try to buy them, but Comcom will likely block you as a major player. Um, so there's that consideration. But you could see in terms of Netcare, Netcare's focused their capital on dividends, share buybacks, um, and on the digitization of their operations while the conversion of their beds from acute to uh, mental health and the like, which are higher margin. Uh, and, and more profitability, and it shifts shifts with the same capex you have. It shifts your shifts your margin, shifts your capacity to where there's demand. Uh, or in life healthcare space, where they're moving out and they're buying s smaller, more diversified assets and slightly different. Let's call them parallel spaces to try to. And both of those are, are movements to try to uh, diversify the the offering. Well, not necessarily bumping up against the competition commission. So I do think acquisitive growth is limited. I think net care. If one sees it as a comfortable operation, especially, by the way, both of these operations uh, had significant diesel bills from load shedding that as we enter a period with hopefully less load shedding should fall to the bottom line. But that's true of Discam and Clicks when we get there. Mm -hmm. But Netcare will likely apply their, their, their free cash flows into share buybacks and, uh, and dividends. Uh, Life Healthcare, we will see how their the, uh, acquisition strategy plays out, but I don't think it'll be overly dramatic. Um, but I, I view both of these operations as single, mid-single-digit revenue growth, uh, mid-double-digit mid uh, bottom-line growth um, with, with pretty comfortable operations, pretty, pretty well run. It's really a question by valuation, yeah. Let's move and talk about Discam and Clicks. We don't have much time left, and I really want to uh, speak about them, only because I was at Discam yesterday, and I still spent more money than I thought I would. Uh, it must be the lights of Keith. I'm telling you, something isn't quite right there. I want to speak about uh, where they might be, because, of course, that, they've got the retail aspect of it, um, and I guess that's a much, a much better place to be uh, when you do think of the medical industry. 
Absolutely. Both Clicks and Discam were built out of pharmacies that have built front shops that effectively then on sell other goods as you're there. As you rightly pointed out, you always walk in for one or two things, and that tends to be the dispensary you go to. And then you walk out, you go, oh, this, have this, this, have this. And, and hence, and over time, I mean, D Discam is still more pharmacy centric than Clicks at this point. Uh, about a third, a third of the retail business comes out of dispensing, whereas Clicks is closer to a quarter. Um, and Discam tends to be big box format, whereas Clicks tends to be small box format. So it's convenience versus scale. That tends to be the, the, the different levers played. Um, but both of them are really, really well-run uh, businesses that have this health theme running through them, but uh, but really have built out the retail offering. Uh, and in both cases, the growing they, in both cases they got a benefit from COVID, and the benefit was they were key dispensaries for COVID vaccines. So you got feet through the door. You are allowed to stay trading because you offered healthcare services, healthcare products, uh, and that allowed that, that allowed business to continue and actually allowed you to grow. Because uh, both of them have loyalty programs, and that's a very key aspect in terms of their flywheel on, on, on generating trade traffic and increasing trade density. Um, but both of them ha have drifted slightly in different directions. Like I said, small box, which is clicks, big box, which is discam. But discam further has got into baby, it's got into insurance, it's, it's both gone into TLC, it's got the wholesale side, uh, CJ distribution, which is matched by Clix's wholesale side, that is a UPD, but Clix is focused on their knitting, focused on their, uh, focused on their uh, house brand, focused on uh, uh, converting really an odd dispensary customer into a steady, loyal, loyal customer um, buying a much larger basket of, of, of products, and they've been very, very good at that. Um, both of them really, really well-run businesses, uh, but both of them exceptionally expensive uh, valuations. Uh, with that said, uh, let's talk about that, that valuation and maybe, uh, you know, sometimes, sometimes something can be expensive, Keith, but it, 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 it should be because, uh, you know, you get great value there. Uh, from a comparison perspective, uh, is there one that does look or fare better than the other? So both Discam and Clicks are sitting on, on a 30 times multiple at this point. You know, so one has to have a view in terms of the future. Uh, is one going to grow faster than the other? Um, is one safer than another? Is one better quality than the other? Uh, and there, when you strip out the noise, there's some, the, the, and you stack them up back to back with each other. You know, Discam on a... On, on a uh, so ignore revenue growth for a moment. At a store level, there's like for like comparison. So comparable same store sales, uh, and that is really store profitability. More feet coming through the door, buying more goods for uh, at bigger baskets. And in fact, in this, Clix is beating Discan. Uh, Clix is still a, a despite being three, four times as big as a disc game, it is still beating it. Uh, they're really, really good at driving that, that aspect of like for like comparison. But then when we dig through other aspects, Clicks also stacks up quite well. So a balance sheet, Clicks is less geared than disc game. So there's less debt, there's less financial risk. In terms of governance, disc game's got a strong founder, but the trade-off with a strong founder is a lot of related party transactions that one has to unpack and, and, and hope that they're arm's length and who's really winning where and how. So there's, there's a little bit of a heart and governance risk at, at Discam. Um, but all of that really trickles down to you're probably looking at equivalent growth profiles going forward. Discam certainly being more aggressive in terms of the avenues for growth they're going to. Some of these might not work though. Flex seems to be sticking to their knitting a lot, a lot better, but but it's a bigger operation and therefore it becomes harder to incrementally grow at the same speed. I would, I would argue we tend to prefer clicks in this space over Discam in terms of quality, but when you look at them globally against global retail pharmacy groups out there, CVS, uh, Walgreens and the like, both stocks are expensive and we actually don't hold either. Wonderful. Uh, Keith, it's all we have time for today. It's been fascinating uh, hearing about uh, this uh, sector and also unpacking it in this manner. Thank you so much uh, for your time today. That was Keith McLaughlin from Integral Asset Management.